All right, here goes the first lesson of the semester. And the first unit is about um, atomic theory and properties of matter. We're going to first start by studying the history of atomic model development. And then we'll talk more about the properties of an atom, like subatomic particles, what isotopes are. So um, the first uh, half is mostly review. So we have to go all the way back to 500 BC, so like two, more than 2,000 years ago. It was then a person named Democritus. Uh, he was the first one to actually propose that everything is made up of tiny, indivisible particles. Right? So if you imagine it, you take any substance, you cut it into smaller, smaller pieces, you're eventually going to end up with something that you cannot cut anymore. And we call it indivisible, and he's Greek, so uh, he call it the atoma. Uh, atoma in Greek means indivisible. So that's what he envisioned. Now, he had no evidence. He's just you know, thinking out loud here. But um, at that time uh, lived Aristotle. So many people were influenced by Aristotle. So what did he have to say? He's like, nope, uh, there is no atom. Okay, like, you're wrong. Uh, I'm right. Aristotle is perhaps one of the most famous philosophers of all time. Uh, he is such a brilliant man that he came up with the scientific uh, hypothesis of the scientific method. He studied plants and animals by dissecting them. So and he also made a lot of uh, claims about the state of the natural world, most of which are wrong. So what did he say about the atom though? Um, there is no atom, but so what's everything made of, according to Aristotle? Well then, Aristotle said, everything in this world is made up of a combination of four different elements. Okay, you can have fire, air, earth, or water, kind of like Avatar, the cartoon. And those elements have a combination of the four properties, hot, dry, wet, and cold. So if you look at that picture, um, fire will be hot and dry, which makes sense. Water is wet and cold, air is hot and wet, and then the earth is dry and cold. It kind of makes sense if you think about it. So that's what he proposes. So according to Aristotle, the periodic table has four elements. Wouldn't that make the course easier? But um, he is not correct. Okay, we know that today that Aristotle, um, most of the, the scientific things that he said were just wrong. So he refuted Democritus. And it sounds silly to us today, like how could everything be made up of those four things? But at that time, everyone believed him because he is the great Aristotle. So you are not supposed to question the great Aristotle. Uh, what he says is true. Aristotle invented empirical um, evidence and proof, but the people around him doesn't seem to want to do it. And very famously, Aristotle claimed that if you drop two objects of different mass, the heavier object will fall faster. This is true if you have air resistance and the mass is quite low, but not in vacuum, this is not true. So nobody actually tested it until Galileo. So that's, that's kind of weird that the, you know, the, the father of empirical testing didn't test it. So anyway, everyone believed Aristotle because he's so great. Um, people tend to gravitate towards authority at the time. So Democritus' idea was dismissed. So for ages, thousands of years, everyone believed that everything was made up of fire, air, water, and earth. So then comes the Dark Ages. So this is from 3rd to 15th century. That was a terrible time to be a scientist. All right? If you come up with new ideas about the natural world that was not aligned with current ideas, um, the best thing that can happen to you is nobody talks to you anymore. You're excommunicated from the church. The worst thing that can happen is death. And right? so if you dare to bring up everything making up of atoms, you know, Aristotle is wrong, well then, you know, you just might get executed and people have died uh, for saying that um, the sun is in the middle of the universe, not the earth. Um, I forget the dude's name, uh, it's not Galileo, 
um, is not Copernicus, although those people did get in trouble for proposing that the sun is in the middle. So uh, not a good time for science. So as a result, scientific progress was halted. Everybody just recanted what Aristotle and ancient philosophers have been saying until recently, um, the 1800s. That was a wonderful age of scientific discovery and the frontiers of bio, chem, and physics. Um, many new discoveries and theories have been created. So starting with John Dalton. Okay, this is a guy named John Dalton. He was the first person to provide empirical evidence of atoms. And he claimed uh, the following. The number one claim is everything is made of atoms. They're indivisible and indestructible. Exactly what Democritus was saying. All right. Is that true though? Um, the making up of atom part is true. But are atoms indivisible and indestructible? No, um, but they, he couldn't have known. Uh, people back in the day, they didn't have the technology. So no, they didn't know that. So according to them, atoms are indivisible and indestructible. And he compared atoms to billiard balls. Um, this is actually um, named the billiard balls model because a billiard ball is just a ball. Uh, it has no distinct features. Atoms are just like billiard balls, just a round sphere with no features except that it is the smallest possible unit. Now second, there are different kinds of atoms. Different elements have the same kind of, uh, sorry, different elements have different kinds of atoms, but the same element would have the same kind of atoms across and they have the same mass and same property if you're the same element. Is this true? No. Because um, of isotopes on, on the periodic table, there are atoms of the same element, but they have different mass. They just have different neutrons. So, but again, he wouldn't have known that. And that is a pretty close approximation to real life. So the third thing that he proposed was that if you have a compound that is a combination of two or more different kinds of atoms. So you can mix them together to make new substances like water, H2O. And this is definitely true. And the last thing that he said was, if you have a chemical reaction, in a reaction, atoms are rearranged. So you kind of mix them up. So AB plus CD, if a chemical reaction happens, then you have you know, a switch up. So you have AD plus CB instead. Um, again, this is the definition of a chemical reaction. So he's right there. So John Dalton made huge leaps forward uh, from fire, earth, and all that nonsense to what is familiar to us, atoms and chemical reactions. So he started this whole atomic revolution thing. What followed was more scientists. So J.J. Thompson, um, he came on the scene a little bit later in uh, 1897. And what he did was he took something called a cathode ray tube in the picture up there. So there is a negative terminal. And then there's a positive terminal and particles were shot from the negative end towards the positive end. Now in the middle of the tube are two plates. Um, those are um, electric field plates. You have, you have a positive plate and a negative plate. So in the middle you have an electric field. What was interesting was that the rays didn't reach the positive plate in a straight line. It was deflected. It was bent. How was it bent? It is evident that the particles were attracted to the positive plate and they were repelled by the negative plate. So it ended up closer to the positive uh, end of the electric plate. So you missed the middle of the target. Why? You can conclude that, well, since negative repel negative and negatives attract positive, that ray that was shot must have been negative. Right, so only then would it attract the positive plate and be repelled by the negative plate. So basically he discovered negative charges inside of atoms and they were later named to be electrons. All right, so atoms are neutral. If you have negative electrons, that means there must be a positive part in the atom to balance it out. And he suggested that the structure of the atom is like a plum pudding. 
that you have a sphere, that a positive sphere of atom, and then inside those sphere are little raisins, kind of like in a plum pudding, you have raisins with the big dough. Those raisins are electrons. So a bunch of little dots that are electrons are embedded within a positive sphere. That's the atom, okay? So that was J.J. Thompson. He won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Later, yet, 1911, the student of Ernest, uh, sorry, the student of J.J. Thompson by the name of Ernest Rutherford, he wanted to find more evidence of his teacher's claim. All right, so he wanted to find evidence of Thompson's model. He's like, oh, my teacher is great. Let me back him up here. Um, let, let me find more conclusive evidence, evidence for this plum, uh, plum pudding. So his idea was to use a gold foil and you shoot alpha particles at the gold foil. So you have a source of alpha particles and alpha particles are just nuclei of helium atoms. So they have a charge of plus two, so they're positive. Now, if you shoot positive particles at a thin piece of gold foil, and you know that the atoms are made up of positive and negative, and the negative is evenly distributed according to J.J. Thompson, well then, if you shoot positive particles, and if you shoot it with enough force, it should rip through and end up on the other side. All right? It's like you shoot a piece of paper with a gun, the bullet should pierce the paper and end up on the other side. And he has this screen, this circular screen around the gold foil, and he predicted that if I shoot the gold foil with the beam of alpha particles, they should end up exactly on the other side of the fluorescent screen, and I will detect it, and I would have proven Thompson correct. All right, so he actually ran this experiment, and to his shock, this happened. All right. Most of the particles did end up on the other side, straight through, no problem. But very rarely, on some occasions, some particles are deflected. Now, there's no reason for this. If the plum pudding model is correct, there's no reason that any particle will be deflected. If you shoot a gun at a piece of paper, the bullet will go through. There's no other reason, no other possibility. But, you know, alas, that's what he observed. Some were deflected, some straight up bounced right back. He's like, okay, um, whoops, I disproved my teacher wrong. So how do you explain this? How is it possible that this happened? So his explanation, so he started thinking to account for what he saw. Imagine that if all the positive charges were condensed in a tiny ball in the middle of the atom, all right, instead of spread out everywhere, if you're just located in the middle, if you miss that ball, you're going to go through. And, you know, because the ball is very small, most of the alpha particles missed that ball. And oh, the ball, the core was oh, named nucleus later. But if you were just to hit the ball, and if you ever play pool or billiards, you know that if you hit the ball at an angle, it will be deflected at an angle. So if you kind of slide at the nucleus, you will be deflected to the side. If you were to hit the nucleus head on, you will bounce right back because positive repel positive. Now, if this was true, then that will perfectly explain the results of the gold foil experiment. So he came up with this idea based on the fact that, well, the nucleus must have been positive okay, because I shot positive particles at it and it bounced back. So um, protons, unnamed protons, the positive charges, they must have been in the nucleus, not everywhere. All right. Now, this idea does perfectly explain the gold foil experiment, okay? So his model of the atom looks something like that. You have, again, a sphere with a positive nucleus in the middle and electrons around that nucleus, okay? That, that's the Rutherford model. But there are some problems. What are the problems? Well, if you think about it, um, how is it possible that the nucleus can stay together? Because according to the laws of physics, positive will repel positive. 
So how can you have a bunch of positive, uh, positive particles so close together in the nucleus and the atom doesn't blow up? So that's problem number one. Well, problem number two is similar um, because positives attract negative. So how come the electrons don't simply fall into the nucleus because they attract each other and completely destroy the atom? So how come that doesn't happen? So these two questions must be answered if we want to accept this model of the atom. So Rutherford tries to answer one of these questions, but he cannot answer the second one. So let's address each problem one at a time. So problem one, how is it possible that all protons being positively charged, how can they stick together like that? Uh, shouldn't they repel and just you know separate? Now, the experimental data does seem to indicate that this is true. All you have to do is explain how this is possible. All right, that's weird because it's, if positive particles really want to you know, separate, they're not going to be together. It's like two people that really hate each other, uh, like Trump and Kim, they're not going to go to the movies together. Like Taylor Swift and Katy Perry, they're not going to hang out. People hate each other, okay? Protons hate each other. How? How is that possible? This is what he proposed. Well, what if there is a middleman, okay? There's a mediator. What if there's a third type of particle? Well, let's call it the neutron because you know it's neutral, it doesn't have a charge. What if they separate the protons? Okay, so in the nucleus, there's not just protons, there's protons and neutrons. And the neutrons happen to you know, sit between a couple of protons to make sure they're not too close. Then you can have a nucleus, all right? Now, the problem is he's just, again, he's talking. He doesn't have anything to back this up. It's just a hypothesis because you know he, he proposed it because this answers one of his problems. But he just doesn't have any proof that this is actually the case. And this doesn't solve the second problem. Okay, like let's give it to him. Let's say, um, Rutherford, you know what? I'm gonna believe you. How do you solve the second problem? You still can't have your atom because electrons would just fall in and you just destroy your atom. And atoms are stable. They don't typically destroy themselves. So how do you explain that one? So Rutherford tried to explain problem one, and he could not explain problem two. Now, problem one still doesn't have evidence, all right? It came a few years later down the line, a chap named James Chatwick. He actually discovered evidence of the neutron. So he discovered the neutron. He won the Nobel Prize for that. So this confirmed Rutherford that yes, okay, your nucleus can exist, and here's how. You have neutrons separating the protons, but still. I mean, the protons are still fairly close to each other, right? How come the nucleus doesn't explode? Well, because of the strong nuclear force. In physics, you learn that there are four fundamental forces of the universe, and the strongest of them all is the strong nuclear force. That is the force that binds nuclei together. The force of attraction between a neutron and a proton is so overwhelmingly strong, it overcomes the force of electrostatic repulsion. Our electromagnetic force is another fundamental force. That is a lot weaker than the strong nuclear force. So in the nucleus, the, the force that binds them together exceeds the force that wants to separate, so the nucleus sticks together. So this explains the existence of atomic nuclei. So Rutherford can have his nucleus, no problem. Okay, cool. So all that's left is the second problem. How come the electrons don't fall in? Now we're gonna answer that in the next lesson because you know uh, we have to summon Niels Bohr for that and that's too long for one lesson. So moving on to more review of subatomic particles. I believe you learned this in grade nine. You need to know the following. You need to know what a nucleus is. You need to know what a proton is. You gotta know what a neutron is and you gotta know what electrons are. So proton, neutrons, and electrons, the symbols, because uh, nobody likes to write big words. Proton P, neutron and electron E, the first letter of their word, followed by a superscript of their charge. So proton is positive, uh, neutrons don't have a charge, so zero. Electrons are negative, so E minus. 
All right, so the mass though, the mass, you don't need to really know the mass for this course. We're not gonna do any calculation that involves the mass of protons, neutrons, or electrons. Now, the reason that it's there is for you to compare the masses between them. If you look at those numbers, you will quickly realize that the proton and neutron, they're really similar. Okay, they're not exactly the same, but you have to go to the third decimal to find a difference. Okay, so they're awfully similar to each other, both 10 to the negative 27. So that means for all intents and purposes, they're equal in mass. Okay, the difference is insignificant. You can just round that away. The electron, on the other hand, you can say that you, you can see that it's 10 to the negative 31. So it is many orders of magnitude smaller, like a, a thousand, more than a thousand times smaller in mass compared to the proton and the neutron. All right, so that's very insignificant. So this means that the mass of an atom comes strictly from the protons and neutrons. Yeah, electrons do contribute, but you know, if you just add up all the mass of an electron, it is still not a fraction of the mass of a proton or neutron, so they don't matter. It's like if you want to measure your own weight, you step on a scale, you have a number, and then you proceed to cut your hair, that, that's not losing weight, okay? That doesn't count. Unless you have super long hair, then you will make a significant difference. But if you just, if you have short hair and you shave your head, you know, you didn't lose weight. It's too insignificant, so that doesn't count. Where can you find these things? Well, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons are around the nucleus, and the charges we've talked about already. So these are the basics of the three subatomic particles. Make sure you know that really well. All right, so moving on to writing symbols. You can express atoms and um, different isotopes of atoms or ions with symbols on, you can find um, on the right. X is a generic uh, variable for any single element. There is no element X that represents anything. A is the mass number, okay? And Z is the atomic number. Now, the atomic number, it's the number of protons an atom has. The elements of the periodic table is arranged in increasing atomic number, okay? And that corresponds to how many protons. Now, if you change the number of protons, you will change the element. So this is like a fingerprint. This defines the element. So let's say you have seven protons. That means you must be nitrogen. Okay, if you add another proton, you become oxygen with eight protons. Okay, so atomic number defines the element. The mass is literally the mass, the sum of the protons and the neutrons. Again, electrons are too light, we don't count them. Okay, so if you wanna do the math, you can get protons and neutrons if you know one, if you know the mass and one of the other. You can just do a subtraction. So let's try to fill out this table. You see that symbol right there, on the first lot of the first row. Uranium with the mass of 238, 92 is the atomic number. So how many protons would this have? Again, protons are the same as atomic numbers. So that must be 92. Okay, you see how this works? This is basically a free one. If you have the atomic number, you will know the number of protons. You will never get it wrong if you just look on the periodic table. Now the neutrons, you gotta do some math. You have a total mass of 238. You have 92 protons. All you have to do is subtract. Okay, if you subtract them, you should get 146. That's the amount of neutrons. The electrons, you have to consider the charge. Does this thing have a charge? It says net charge of zero, so no. If you have a net charge of zero, that means you have equal numbers of protons and electrons. The positives all cancel with the negatives. You will have 92 electrons equal to the protons. Okay, does that make sense? Now I'm gonna give you like a minute to fill out the rest of this table. It doesn't take that long. Um, it's just simple addition and subtraction. So I'll take it up after a minute. Uh, please begin. All right, so the first row is given. We talked about this already. So the second row, uh, what element is this? 
you have 20 protons. Okay, that's all you need to figure out what element this is. There's only one element with 20 protons, and that would be calcium. How many uh, neutrons? Well, it says 20. So that means the mass is 20 plus 20, 40. So this is calcium 40. The net charge, it says, is plus 2. So you put a plus 2. So this is an ion, not just an atom. So you can use the net charge to figure out the amount of electrons. You have 20 protons. Your net charge is plus 2. That means you have two additional protons compared to electrons. So electrons must be 18. All right, so that's how you will fill out this row. The last row is similar, 23 protons. Well, what element has 23 protons? You can just look. Calcium, strontium, titanium, vanadium. Okay, that's vanadium. So 51, because 23 plus 28 is 51, 23 protons, you put that on the bottom. It's a 3 plus. How do I know it's a 3 plus? Compare the protons to the electrons. 23 protons. 20 electrons, you have three additional protons, so this must be a plus three. Okay, so that's how you will fill a table like this using the symbols. Now, let's move on to isotopes. Now, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, what an isotope is. An isotope is basically atoms of the same element. They have the same number of protons, but they differ in their number of neutrons. In the picture shown, you have two atoms of carbon. On the left, figure A, you have carbon 12. Six protons, six neutrons. Okay, so six plus six is 12. Now there's another type of carbon, carbon 14. You have six protons, well you must have six protons to be carbon, and eight neutrons, so six plus eight is 14. The properties of these two carbons are really basically identical. Your body does not really differentiate between these two. There exists carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 in the world. Your body has all of them. You will still make your glucose, well, you wouldn't, a plant would, and then you would eat it. The glucose can contain six carbon twelve, most likely, but you know, once in a while you have one carbon-14, sometimes you have one carbon-13. It doesn't really matter, okay? So these are isotopes of both carbon atoms. And um, hydrogen has three different isotopes. Normal hydrogen is 99.98% of all hydrogen. You have one proton and that's it, no neutrons at all. So one proton, one electron, that's your hydrogen atom. Now, if you have hydrogen two, that means you have a mass of two, you have a proton and a neutron, we actually give it another name, uh, deuterium. Same thing as hydrogen two, the symbol for deuterium is D capital D, there is no other element with capital D. Just know that deuterium is actually hydrogen. And then there's tritium, hydrogen three. You have two neutrons and a proton. All of these are hydrogen. You can see how rare deuterium and tritium are. Most hydrogens are just normal. So if you actually fill out this table, um, hydrogen has a mass of one because one proton. And how many neutrons? Zero. Okay, deuterium has a mass of two, hydrogen two. Again, you have one proton because you're hydrogen, so one plus one is two. And then lastly, tritium, a mass of three, because you have three subatomic particles, one proton, you can't have more than that. If you have two, then you're helium. And then how many neutrons? Well, you have two neutrons, so that will be two. All right, see how this works? But all of them are hydrogen atoms, okay? They have similar properties, not exactly identical, but similar. There's something called heavy water, um, that's D2O instead of H2O, so you, you have deuterium instead of hydrogen, but it's still water because it's hydrogen. All right, so these isotopes, they're similar, okay? But they have a key difference. Not all isotopes are stable, all right? Some of them will decay because you have too many neutrons, the nucleus doesn't bind together as well. Um, as you know, if, if you had less. So normally, if you have a large atom with a large nucleus, that's probably gonna be unstable and we call it radioactive. So there are radioisotopes. A radioisotope is just an isotope of an atom that is unstable 
and it will spontaneously break into smaller nuclei. So a nucleus can break, and that's radioactivity. Now, uranium is a prime example of this. All isotopes of uranium are radioactive. And we use this to our advantage. Uranium is a coveted uh, mineral because of its applications. We can use uranium, the fact that if it breaks, it will generate a lot of energy. We can harness that energy to generate electricity. So in nuclear power plants, we use uranium. How this works is, well, it was, once uranium breaks, a tiny bit of that mass is converted into energy with the equation e equals mc squared. You have to multiply the mass by c squared, and c squared is a huge number. So that means for a tiny bit of mass, you will get tremendous energy. So this is extremely useful. Nuclear fission reactors take advantage of this fact. So they break uranium on purpose in a controlled manner. So you harness that energy, you use that energy to heat up water, to make it into steam, and then that steam will turn a turbine which has a magnet on it. And if you spin a magnet, you generate a current. That's how you generate electricity in nuclear power plants. Now, you could use this constructively, or you can use this destructively. In fact, we use this destructively first. The atomic bomb was invented, and one of them was a uranium bomb. And then later, they're like, hold on, we don't have to kill people with this. We can actually make people's lives better by generating electricity. So yeah, you could make nuclear weapons or nuclear power plants. It depends on what you want to do with it, OK? Like Canada, we do have nuclear reactors, but we don't have nuclear weapons. Um, North Korea, I think, is the opposite. Um, I don't know if they have nuclear reactors, but they definitely tried to get nuclear weapons, and I think they did it. Uh, here's a copyrighted video that I'm not allowed to show you because I'm going to post this on YouTube. Um, I'm going to pause this. All right, so that was a summary of isotopes. Uh, the last little bit that he mentioned, you don't have to worry about that, the abundance of um, atomic isotopes. That's grade 11 stuff. All right, so let's move on to the size of an atom and you know, compared to the nucleus. So if you imagine that an atom is a football stadium, if you were to take an atom and you know, make it bigger at the size of a football stadium, how big would the nucleus be? The nucleus of that atom would be akin to a fly in the center of the football stadium. It's that small. Now, what does that mean? If you have an adjacent atom, you will that means have an adjacent football stadium and the nucleus of that atom will be another fly in the middle. So the two nuclei will be very far apart from each other and very small compared to the radius of the atom. Okay, so what would that entail? Well, because protons and neutrons, so the nucleus, can, constitutes almost 100% of the mass of the atom, this is saying that all of the mass of the atom is condensed in that tiny nucleus, meaning that the rest of the atom is just empty space. All right, so the atom is effectively 99.9% .9 empty space. So the atoms in your face is 99.9% .9 empty space. Your desk is 99.9% .9 empty space. The computer screen that you're staring at right now is 99.9% .9 empty space. So if you try to walk through a wall thinking that all, you know, all the nuclei will kind of just slide right past each other because it's mostly empty space anyway, you're going to quickly realize that doesn't work. You're going to bump your head on the wall and it's going to hurt. Now, does anyone know why? If everything is 99.9% .9 empty space, why can't you just walk through walls? Why does it hurt when you bump your head? Does anyone want to answer that one? No? Well, consider that nuclei are all positive. If you try to walk into a wall, the positive nuclei will start to repel each other. All right, so the reason that it hurts if you walk into a tree is because of electrostatic repulsion. Okay? The electromagnetic force is what makes objects feel solid. Okay? You don't think 
that the, a computer is empty space because your vision, your sense of touch has evolved to just make you think that it is a complete solid because that's useful to you. It's not useful to think at an atomic level because they're too small. So in our experience, nothing seems like it's transparent despite the fact that it's 99.9% .9 empty space. All right, so that's how small nuclei are, just to put that into perspective. Um, problem number two, if protons are positive and electrons are negative, so how come the electrons don't fall into the nucleus, right? So wouldn't this in the picture happen? Wouldn't it spiral it's like a toilet? If you flush, like things will just go down. But why doesn't this happen? Well, to answer this question, we need um, the next class. So uh, we need to use the photoelectric effect and um, Bohr to understand the reason behind that. So here is another video summarizing atomic history. All right, so that was the video. So this is a summary of what we've learned in this class, um, atomic history, starting from Democritus to now, the, well, not now, but to Rutherford. And then we talked about atomic number, atomic mass, what the atom is consisted of, the relative sizes and mass of neutrons, um, protons and electrons, and then isotopes. So do we have any questions so far? If you do, please ask. Seriously, there was a lot of questions in the morning class. No? All right, so um, we are going to move on to the next lesson after a break. So I'm going to stop right here.